that really what the 40 days of prayer and fasting is really all about. Getting us ready for the midnight cry. Getting the people around us ready for the midnight cry. Amen. Well, welcome to day eight of the 40 days of prayer. I've been hearing from many of you about how you're enjoying this journey together with your prayer partner. I know that I have enjoyed this journey supremely with my partners. It's been incredible so far. Some have begun fasting in addition to their praying and great things are beginning to happen. We're praying for various people. Billy, how many do we have? 122 praying in this 40 days of prayer and we're praying for 600 and 610 people, 610 people. Let that sink in for a minute. It's amazing. It's amazing. These are people that the Holy Spirit has laid on our hearts. People that the Holy Spirit has has told us to pray for. And of course, we're going to reach out to those people in a very practical way when the time is right. Some of us have already begun doing that. Many of us are excited about the possibilities of what God is going to do during this 40 days of prayer and fasting. But some may be wondering, is God really going to do anything? Is the Holy Spirit going to be poured out at all? Will this 40 days of prayer come and go and we'll forget all about it? Will it quickly be forgotten? Well, one thing is sure. I'm absolutely sure of, if the Holy Spirit is poured out, it will not quickly be forgotten. Amen? 2,000 years later, we're still talking about the day of Pentecost and all the great things that happened there on that day. 2,000 years later, we know that the disciples went from hiding out for, in fear of their lives from the Jewish leaders to going out and preaching widely everywhere with holy boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people that day, 3,000 people were added to the church. Don't think I wasn't thinking about that when I went over to India. And we preached, myself and five other pastors preached to thousands of people every single night. We were in different locations. We each had our, our... person that took us around, but by the time we left there, almost 7,000 had been baptized. I can't take credit for that. We just showed up and preached. The Holy Spirit was moving before we ever got there. He was working, preparing those souls, ripening them for the harvest, and they were harvested in. Of course, now they're they're getting ready for the great harvest when Jesus comes back. But we know on the day of Pentecost that the Bible tells us that tongues of fire rested on every head. How would you like to see that? Wouldn't that be incredible? And of course, the biblical gift of tongues. Notice I said the biblical gift of tongues. The biblical gift of tongues was evidenced by those present. It was an incredible day. What an awesome experience that must have been. Amen? But I hope we realize that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, he's not always poured out in the same way. You do realize that, right? You know, we talked about the great revival over in in Wales, over in the UK, where in a nine-month period, 100,000 people came to Christ. It started with a couple people, and 100,000 people in the span of nine months came to Christ. But you know, as I've read up on that experience, as I've read up on what happened there, I can't find one example of anybody speaking using the gift of tongues. Maybe they did, but I haven't seen it. I can't find one example of a tongue of fire being on even one person's head. But yet, 100,000 people in nine months came to Christ. Did the Holy Spirit do that? I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it, man couldn't have done that. No, you see, when the Holy Spirit is poured out here, he's going to be poured out in a way that best fits us, that best suits us. Of course, the manifestations on the day of Pentecost 
or what was appropriate then, but they might, may not be exactly what is needed here. But you know, to even be talking about this, to even be having this conversation assumes a lot. It assumes a lot. I mean, why would we think that the Holy Spirit would be poured out here? That's what I really want to look at today. I mean, the day of Pentecost was 2,000 years ago. And this was right before Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus had just wrapped up his earthly ministry. Why should we even assume that? Some may be thinking, Pastor, you better hope something happens. <laughs> you sure have hyped this thing to God's people. You better hope something happens. Thank goodness it's not dependent on me. It's dependent on him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So let me ask you, will the Holy Spirit be poured out as a result of over 120 people in this church, that's most of our weekly attendance, will the Holy Spirit be poured out as a result of that? <clears throat> will a time of refreshing come here at the Lynchburg SDA Church? That's what we're talking about today. Does God sometimes hold back from giving the Holy Spirit when his people pray for the Holy Spirit? Will our prayers bring the Holy Spirit during this 40-day journey? That's what I want to look at. That's really what I want to focus on. Because I can promise you this, if the Holy Spirit doesn't come, the 40 days of prayer really mean nothing. It's just a program. It means nothing. It will end and be forgotten. It'll be insignificant. So this morning, what I want to do is go to God's word and see if we can find some answers. See if we can find something that will tell us something about this. But of course, as always, before we do, we need to bow our heads and say a word of prayer. So please bow your heads with me at this time. Father God, thank you so much for your word that answers difficult questions like we're talking about this morning. Will the Holy Spirit come when we pray? Lord, without your word, it's just conjecture. It's just guessing. It's just assuming. But with your word, it leads us into truth. It shines light on our path. So this morning, Father, send that light. May you be high and lifted up in this service. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said Amen. Please take out your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. That's where we're going to be spending our time this morning. Billy, I hope I'm not stealing your sermon topic. Luke chapter 11, 5 through 8. I thought last night, maybe I should have called Billy. <laughs> if I am, I'm sorry. <laughs> he hasn't told me exactly where he's going, so hey. Maybe the Holy Spirit's leading us in different places, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Luke chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 8. This is just after the Lord's Prayer. The subtitle of my Bible reads, A friend comes when? At midnight. A friend comes at midnight. Starting in verse 5. And he, Jesus, said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend... Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on a long journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give it to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give it to him, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, because of his persistence, because of his what, church? Persistence. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. He'll give him as many as he needs, is what it says. Well, this parable follows, of course, as I said, the Lord's Prayer. And while my sermon isn't on the Lord's Prayer today, I found it very interesting as I was studying this chapter, something I really never stopped and thought about before, or at least not lately, is that when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's designed for people praying together. Have you ever thought about that? It's designed for people praying together. Listen at the words. Jesus told us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. Not my Father, our Father, which art in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not lead us into temptation and deliver us from what? Evil. It's a community prayer. You see, all prayer is powerful, amen? Do you really believe that? All prayer is powerful, church. But there's something extra special when God's people come together and they're in agreement and they're in unity and they're pouring their hearts out to God together. That's extra special. There's something extra special about that. That's one of the things I really appreciate about the 40 days of prayer and fasting. Because you see, we're paired up. All of us have prayer partners. You know, I'm a little more blessed than some of the rest of you. I have two prayer partners. I've got two. Maybe some of you do too. But we're all on the same call together. Thank goodness they both live in the same house. It's very difficult sometimes to get three people on the same or the same call at the same time. But I have two prayer partners, and it's been an incredible blessing. You see, when God's people, listen to me, when God's people come together and they pray in one accord, mountains move. Mountains move. Incredible things happen. In the parable we just read, Jesus invited his listeners to imagine a friend coming at midnight for hospitality and lodging. It was common back then in that part of the world for people to travel at night because of the intense heat around there. They would often do this, but this is unusually late. Even if they traveled after dark, for him to come at midnight indicates he was probably delayed somehow. This guest comes at midnight and he's apparently hungry. He's wanting something to eat. Families at that time would normally break, bake their bread in the mornings. They would bake their bread that they're going to eat for the entire day in the morning time. And then the next morning they would bake more. Well, here comes this friend at midnight after this family has used all their bread up. This person, this host wants to be hospitable but he has nothing to be hospitable with. Are you with me? They've eaten all their bread. Well, while none of us would want to ever be inhospitable, amen? None of us would ever want to do that. In that day and age, it was like a cardinal sin. You did not ever dishonor somebody. It was almost, not quite, but it was almost akin to cursing God. Honor was huge. This is a friend who's needing help to tell him, sorry, I don't have any bread. You'll have to go to bed hungry tonight would be to dishonor that friend. So this host goes to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night. And he begins to knock on the door. Probably no answer at first. I know if somebody knocks on my door, they're going to have to ring the bell probably several times or knock on the door several times. I'm not getting up and running to the door. Yes. In the middle of the night. This guy's standing out there knocking. Hello, I need help. What do you want? A friend has come in the middle of the night here. We've used all our bread. I need three loaves of bread. That friend must have been pretty hungry. He's going to eat three loaves of bread. But nonetheless, that's what Jesus says. Three loaves of bread. Wow. Well, to fully understand what Jesus is trying to tell us in this parable, stay with me. We have to understand how families slept back then. We have to understand how they slept back then. You see, everybody didn't have their own bedroom like we have now. Poor people. Everybody slept in the same room. Everybody slept in the same place, in the center of the room. Thank God we don't do that now. (laughs) You know, I remember going on vacation and trying to sleep in the bed next to my daughter. Sorry, Jewel. But before I knew it, her feet are in my back. And then I turn and her knees are sticking me in the back and I wake up a couple hours later and her head is in my back. It doesn't work well. 
But this is how these people slept every single night. They slept on a mat together in the center of the room. Thank you, Jesus. We don't do that. Now th stop and think about this. Stay with me. For the neighbor to get up and help his friend, he would have to get up in the dark, in the dark, and climb over his wife and children in the dark and light a torch, light a lantern. He'd have to light something to bring some light into the room so he can see what's happening. He would have to go over and move the heavy wooden beam that's barring the door, which would make a lot of racket, I'm sure. And then he would have to open the door. Yes, can I help you? And of course, he would have to do all those steps a second time before he went back to bed, after he's given this bread to his neighbor. Except this time, he would be blowing the lantern out. But there's no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure there's no doubt in your mind, that in the process, he would wake up his entire family. He would wake everybody up. He'd probably wake the animals up too, since some of them stayed in the house as well. That's a scary thought. That's what they did back then. You know, my wife would do anything to help anybody. She would give you the shirt off her back. But if you ask her to wake up our kids, she will look at you like you've lost your mind. <laughs> she ain't waking up the kids. If you call her in the middle of the night and you're stranded somewhere and you need something, I'm sorry, call back in the morning when my kids are awake. Don't wake up the kids unless the house is on fire. And it better be half engulfed in fire before you wake up the kids. I'm telling you, this is serious. If this man woke his family up, chances are he would end up with half a night's sleep at best. And I'm sure back then they worked from sun up till sundown. It's the way it was over when I went to India. I know some of us do that, but they work out in the fields. Hard labor from sun up till sundown. Imagine somebody coming in the middle of that and trying to wake you up because they need bread. That's what we're talking about here. The neighbor knows this is a huge inconvenience. This is a huge problem. And so look what he says once again. Don't bother me. The door has already been shut. The children and I are in bed. And I can't get up and give you anything. Forget bread. He says anything. In other words, I'm not doing anything for you. Get out of here. Leave me alone. It's just not happening with this neighbor. But you know what? The host with the unexpected guest won't listen. He won't take no for an answer and he keeps on. I need help. I'm not leaving. You might as well come and help me. I'm not going anywhere. Leave me alone. He won't stop. He will not stop. And so finally, the neighbor realizes if I don't get up and give that guy some bread to shut him up, I'm not getting any sleep tonight because he won't stop. So finally, he gives in. Gets up, does the whole routine, gives the three loaves of bread. Talk about straining your relationship with your neighbor. Still going to live next to that guy the next day. But you know what? This guy, this, this host, he doesn't care. He's not going to stop until he gets what he wants. He's not going to stop asking. He's not going to stop pleading. He's not going to stop begging until he gets what he wants. He wasn't going to stop knocking. He wasn't going to stop asking. He wasn't going to stop begging until he got what he came for. I wonder today, church, if that's your attitude and my attitude toward prayer. Is that our attitude toward prayer and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? So far, we have prayed daily for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And you know what? This may be the first time, not trying to offend or insult anybody, this may be the first time that some of us have prayed so persistently, day after day after day, surely with somebody else, 
This may be the first time that some of us have done that. And when you're praying, I pray that you won't pray, but not really pray. Are you following me? Well, your heart's not in it. You're going through a routine. Let me clue you, that's powerless. Make sure your heart is in it. Make sure you're sincere when you're asking. But when you're doing so, you see, the 40 days is a routine almost. It's a routine with persistence built in. Not only are we praying for the Holy Spirit, but we're also praying for those five names that the Holy Spirit has brought to our heart. Those 600 and however many people. Sorry, I can't remember the number. 610. Thank you. Billy's our numbers guy. But I wonder if that's our attitude toward prayer this morning. Is it? This may be the first time that some of us have prayed so persistently for a set number of people like this for any length of time. What are we doing during the 40 days of prayer or what we are doing during the 40 days of prayer is exactly what Jesus is telling us to do in this parable. Are you with me? It's exactly what Jesus is telling us to do in this parable. You see, the parable teaches us, it shows us that God wants us to be persistent. He wants us to not go away. He wants us to keep knocking and asking and begging and pleading. Because it shows him that our hearts are in it. It shows him that our hearts are in it. Especially when we're praying for somebody else. It shows that what we're praying for is so overwhelmingly important to us that we're going to continue. We're going to keep knocking. We're going to keep begging. We're going to keep pleading until it happens. We really want this. In this case, the blessing we've asked for, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and for those that we love, those five names to be revived. This parable shows us that interceding to God for others is powerful. It's powerful. You see, those names, those five names on your list, you may think, you may wonder, I wonder if anything will happen. Well, let me tell you, you don't have to wonder because it's already happening. The Holy Spirit is working on their heart. They, of course, have a choice. They can say no. But don't you think for a minute that when you pray for somebody, the Holy Spirit doesn't go and begin working. He does. He does. Yes, the parable shows us that interceding to God for others in a persistent manner will be rewarded. It will be rewarded. Do we believe that? few of us do. Why does it always come from this side of the church first? And then I have to say something. Oh, wait a minute. From my angle here, sheep on the right, goats on... No. <laughs> do we really believe that, church? Amen. 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 During this 40 days of prayer, of course, we're interceding for at least five people. And you know what? In many cases, those five people are hungry. And they don't even realize it. They don't even know it. They're looking in all the wrong places. They're trying to get filled everywhere else except where they should. Many are try going to the world to be filled. But it's just going to leave them hungry. It's just going to leave them hungry. The last place a lot of those people think they'll be filled is with Jesus and a church. But you know what? Our prayers are going to ensure that the Holy Spirit at least introduces that thought in their mind. Finally, in the parable, we find a neighbor who is bothered. He's put out. But you know what? He's so beautiful about this. He's the exact opposite of God. This neighbor is the exact opposite of God. Think about it. Go away. Leave me alone. You're bothering me. Not with God. You see, God wants us to bother him. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to petition him. He wants us to pour our hearts out to him and plead with him. He wants all that. When we pray, 
God leaps into action. He doesn't lay in the bed and say, uh, ask a few hundred more times and then I'll think about it. No, the speed for seeing a change isn't slowed by God. Oftentimes it's slowed because of you and me or the person we're praying for. Our persistence during the 40 days of prayer and fasting will be rewarded. I believe that with all my heart. It will be rewarded. I'm already seeing that. I'm already seeing it. I'm already hearing stories about inactive members who are wanting to come back to church. I've heard at least two of those stories already. Inactive members that are wanting to come back to church. Praise God. That's a miracle. Why is this happening? Why is it happening? Because we've been praying and we've been interceding for them. Not that we can take any credit. The Holy Spirit's led us to do this. He deserves from start to finish all the credit. But the prayers and the intercession is making a difference. You see, when we reach out to those five people, we shouldn't be surprised to find that something's been going on here. Something's been happening. The Holy Spirit's already beat us there. He's already been at work. It shouldn't be any surprise to discover that the Holy Spirit has put a desire in their hearts to come back, to seek Jesus, to make a change. Jesus confirms this. Look at verses 9 through 12 with me, please. Verses 9 through 12. He says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, what? Receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from his father among you, from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Of course not. Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, and it will. He doesn't say might. He doesn't say maybe. He doesn't say if you meet all the conditions. He says it will be given to you. It will be open to you. It will be open to us, church. Do we really believe that? What will be open to you and I? What will be opened? He says it will be opened. What will be opened? In the context of this chapter, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit and also the blessings of God. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're always going to get everything we ask for. Amen? God is too wise for that. Remember, he's a big God with big plans. His plans are bigger and better than we could ever imagine. They're huge. You see, sometimes we ask for just enough to meet our understanding, what we think, the way we think things should work out. But God knows what is best in every situation. And of course, sometimes, hear me now, we ask for things that are not good for us. Ever done that? I know I have. We ask for things that are not good, with, good for us or disagree with God's plan for our life. Sometimes he has to say no because he loves us. But let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Is no just as much of an answer as yes? Sure. Is wait just as much of an answer as yes? Sometimes we get in this habit of thinking if God doesn't say yes, he didn't answer my prayer. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. My kid asks for a knife in the kitchen, I'm not going to say yes every time and put it in his hand. No way. No way. I thank God for saying no to some of the lame brain things that I've prayed for over the years. If he would have answered some of those prayers, no telling where I'd be, no telling who I'd be with, it probably wouldn't be you folks, or who I'd even be married to. No telling what I'd be doing right now. May not even be walking with God. 
If you feel like God is saying no all the time, if I feel like God is saying no all the time, maybe we need to check the things we're praying for. One, one request that we don't have to wonder about is when we pray to receive the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wonder about that. God wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit more than anything. Do you believe that? Sometimes God is ready and willing to answer our request. Listen. But we, or the person we're praying for, isn't ready to receive what we're asking for. Listen to this, Christ Object Lessons, page 143. In the parable, the one we've been talking about, the petitioner was again and again repulsed. Repulsed means rejected or denied. But he did not relinquish his purpose. He refused to quit asking. So our prayers do not always seem to receive an immediate answer. But Christ teaches that we should not cease to pray. Prayer is not to work any change in God. Are you hearing this? It's not to work any change in God. It is to bring us into harmony with God. When we make request of him, he may see that it is necessary for us to search our hearts. To rep repent of sin. Therefore, he takes us through test and trial. He brings us through humiliation. Ouch. That we may see what hinders the working of the Holy Spirit through us, and I would say in us. Is there anything that's hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in your life during this 40 days of prayer? Is there anything that's hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in my life during this 40 days of prayer? Does the Holy Spirit have control of your will? Does he have control of my will? Does the Holy Spirit have control of your life and my life? You see, it's not until we put our lives and everything we are, everything we have in the hands of the Holy Spirit that he can do all that he wants to do in our lives. Don't hold anything back. Put it all on the line. Put everything in his hands. And watch him work to transform your life and the, begin to transform the lives of the people around you. You see, sometimes we're praying for other people to change when we're the one that needs to change. To pray for the Holy Spirit and then refuse to give him control of our lives is to fight against him and to grieve him. Remember reading about that this week? Grieving the Holy Spirit? You are reading your books, right? I saw a couple heads. A lot of people just sat there. like, uh-oh. <laughs> okay, let's go back to day one. It's to grieve the Holy Spirit. If we have grieved the Holy Spirit, the book addressed that this week. We need to confess that. We need to ask for forgiveness. And we need to pray to receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. And going forward, we need to say yes. We need to surrender our will to him. Maybe there's someone here thinking, Pastor, I really like what you're saying about the Holy Spirit coming into my life when I pray for him. I really like that thought. But how do I know that he'll even come? Maybe someone is thinking, I've, I've got things that aren't right in my life. I've got problems in my life. I've got things that I'm doing that I know God doesn't like. How do I know that the Holy Spirit will be given to me? How do I know, how do I know that I'm not just asking for the Holy Spirit, but God's saying, uh-uh-uh, you don't qualify. Deny. Do we have to have it all together to receive the Holy Spirit? Do we get perfect and then pray for the Holy Spirit to come? Okay, now you can do it, Lord. Doesn't work that way. You're right, Katie. Doesn't work that way. Jesus anticipates this thinking, this way of thinking. 
Because he says in verses 11 and 12, go back and look at that with me. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a, uh, instead a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? In other words, if you and I can give good things to our children, even when they don't deserve it, will God do any less? Are we better parents to our kids than God is to us? No way. You know, no one, I want you to hear this. No one who is filled with the Holy Spirit on this earth today deserves to be that way. No one. No one. Jesus says, everyone who asks receives. The question is not, will the Holy Spirit come? The question is, what will I do when the Holy Spirit does come? That's really what we need to stop and think about here. If I'm full of rebellion and sin, and I pray to receive the Holy Spirit, he'll come, but he may not be able to fill me. He may have to convict me for a time, bring me to repentance. He may need to instill a desire in me for a changed life. But you know what? It says everyone who asks will receive. He will come. God doesn't reserve the Holy Spirit for only perfect people. Thank you, Jesus, or we would all be lost. What God is looking for when we pray for the Holy Spirit, I alluded to earlier, is that we ask in sincerity of heart, that we really mean it. That we're not just going through the motions because a book tells us to do it, but because we really want that. Because we really want the presence of Jesus to be in our hearts. That we really ask in sincerity of heart. That we have an open heart. That we have a willingness to obey God's will and a willingness to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. Imagine asking the Holy Spirit to come and every time he tells me to do something, I say, no, I'm going to do it my way. I've always done it this way. No, you can hang out, Holy Spirit, but I'm going to do it my way. Doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. It simply means that we truly want the Holy Spirit in our lives. We truly want the presence of Jesus in our lives. It means that we want his will in his way, not my will in my way. If we as sinful human beings can show grace and love to children, even though they mess up and are bad, and I know I do it all the time. Britain does it all the time. I'm sure many of you do it all the time. How much more will God? God is perfect. And will do much more than any sinful man or woman. We don't have to wonder about this. Look at verse 13 with me quickly as we finish up here. Verse 13. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who what? To those who ask him. Can somebody please say amen? In Matthew 7, 11, Matthew includes this same verse, but he changes it up a little bit. He changes the end part. He changes it from Holy Spirit to good things. In other words, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? In addition to giving his son the best gift that the Holy Spirit, God could probably possibly give us, is the Holy Spirit. You see, we may pray for all sorts of people and all sorts of things, and God may answer all those requests. He will answer those requests. But ultimately, what God really wants to give us is his spirit. Because when the spirit comes, transformation comes. Eternal life comes. Joy and peace come, and sin begins to lose its appeal. So again, I ask, will the Holy Spirit be poured out in this church? I believe the answer is yes. Over 120 people are praying right now to receive the Holy Spirit. God wants it to happen. Can you see it from these verses? I believe we're already beginning to see evidence 
that he is being, being poured out. I think I speak for all of us when I say, Holy Spirit, come and have your way in this church and in our lives. Have your way. We want you and we need you. Come, Holy Spirit. You know, as we close today, I know we're right at the time to close, I want to share just a sample of what I've been seeing, what I've been experiencing in my little 40 days prayer group. I'd like to invite Chad and Tristan to come forward for just a minute. I want to ask them to tell you what the Holy Spirit has been doing in their lives. Powerful. Look forward to our calls every evening. Tristan, when we started this 40-day prayer journey, were you perfect? No. Did you have it all together? No. Did it seem strange when you first began to pray for the Holy Spirit? And when the Holy Spirit began to come, what did you sense, what kind of changes did you sense in your life? Step a little closer to the mic so they can hear you. I felt more um, involved. I felt um, uplifted. I felt... Um, different. I just felt like I didn't want to do things I normally would want to do. I, I felt like video games really didn't matter. I felt um, watching TV really didn't matter. Movies didn't matter. It's just getting the Bible. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And, and Chad, as, as you've been going through this journey, or as the three of us have been going through this journey, what kind of changes have you sensed? The courage to change. The courage to change. Wow, wow. Let me tell you, these guys, we have some deep conversations on the phone. Um, especially this guy, man, he blows me away. <laughs> but Chad, too, it's been incredible. What kind, of, what kind of change do you think is on the horizon for you and your family as a result of this? Spiritual. Spiritual. Praise God. Elaborate a little bit. What do you mean by that? The infilling of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Do you sense that this is really going to make a lasting change in your lives and in your family? It's the only way. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Isn't our God good, church? Isn't he amazing? This is just a sample of what he's beginning to do. Just a sample. I, you know, when, Tr when Tristan was on the phone the other night and he was sharing how all these changes are happening, he was kind of surprised. He's like... I'm not sure what's going on. And I say, praise God, brother. That's the Holy Spirit. He's got completely different plans for our lives than we have for our lives. Amen? You guys can go back to your seats. Thank you so much. I called Chad this morning and asked him, him and Tristan to do this. There was a long pause there for a minute on the telephone. Like, have you lost your mind? <laughs> But you know what? I'm excited. And I can see God working and doing things. If somehow you have got a little behind in your 40-day prayer journal, get back to it. Get back to it. Great things are already happening. Me and my group talk every evening right around 9 o'clock. I know some of the groups are talking at the crack of dawn. Maybe in the middle of the night. Who knows? Some people, 9 o'clock is the middle of the night, but not for me. <laughs> but anyway, God is being poured out. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. If you're here today for the first time and you haven't got to sign up before now, you can still do so. You can still do so. See Billy Wright. And I need to tell you about one other thing. Billy is going to go to the foyer one more time. You know, the old devil, he's, he's a trip, I tell you. The books are on back order. This whole shutdown of the Review and Herald is really throwing a wrench in the works. But you know what? We're not going to let him win. We've got more copies. If you did not receive a book and you had paper copies last time, we're going to give you another seven days. We're going to give you another seven days, and we're working really hard to get those books in hand. The ABC is working really hard to get those books in hand. Amen. Don't leave here without, without your next seven days. 
Otherwise, you're going to be ask, have to ask your partner to read it to you on the telephone. You don't want to do that. All right, I'll invite the praise team to come back up at this time. Praise God. This is a hymn. I don't think we sing it a lot, but uh, it's I Must Tell Jesus. I want everybody to sing along with us. And I think this is very fitting to go with uh, 40 days of prayer. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for me. I want everybody to sing along with us. <laughs> I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind of passionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Tell Jesus. Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Did you tell Jesus? Please bow your heads with me. Lord God, we're so grateful for this parable that you shared so long ago. It tells us a lot about prayer. It tells us a lot about the Holy Spirit and, and receiving the Holy Spirit. Lord, as Tristan pointed out to us and Chad when the Holy Spirit comes, he begins to reprioritize our lives. He begins to change things. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to be poured out in this church. I pray he will continue to be poured out in the lives of the people we're praying for. I wonder today with every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's someone here who has not yet made your decision to Follow Jesus all the way in baptism, and you would like to raise your hand and say, I would like to plan for my baptism. Is there somebody here? Amen. I wonder today if there's someone here who realizes that you need more of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And you'd like to raise your hand to God and say, whatever obstacles are standing in the way, I want them gone. I want them removed. Who would raise their hand and say that? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Please record these decisions in heaven. Send the grace necessary 
for us to have a successful victory. And thank you, Lord, for giving us your Holy Spirit and for loving us like you do. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.